Hey guys, I wanted to make a video about the more specifics of shipbuilding and really get into the nitty gritty of it. I wouldn't call it min-maxing per se, but hopefully I can shed some light into how you can maximize your ship's efficiency because I see the mistake often that class C is better than class A or that more expensive is better and that isn't necessarily always the case. As is the answer with most things, it depends. It depends on the ship you're making, the role it will fulfill, and the perks you have unlocked. This video, however, will not cover much of shipbuilding's easier to understand aspects that many guides already cover. If you take away anything from this video, let it be this. You might want to upgrade all your ships to class C, but I'm here to tell you, don't. If why you want to upgrade your reactors for more power, better shields, better weapons, better engines, or a better grab drive, you might actually be making your ship worse. Think about what role you want your ship to fulfill and how you want it to perform and plan accordingly. Class C ships might have more power on average than Class A or B, but they have much more things that take up power to achieve a minimum viable performance. They need many powerful engines and a strong grab drive to counteract their increased mass, and they need stronger weapons and shields because they are slower and less maneuverable. With that said, let's get into it. Let's start off with the most important aspect of all ships, power. This is very important and is a constant theme throughout the video as we discuss each specific module. If the reason you want a class C reactor is for more power, then I'm here to tell you it isn't that simple. Take a look at these reactors. These reactors are all at the top of their class that I currently have unlocked. Starting with class A, you'll see they both generate 20 points into power. Class B with 16 and 18. Class C with 24, 20, and 29. Now for reactors at the top of their class that I have unlocked with ship design, starting with class A again, the first one generates 26 points into power, another 26, class B at 28, 27, class C at 30, 34, and 34 again. You'll notice that there isn't really much of a difference between them. Yes, Class C does provide more power, but they also require more engines that are more powerful and will likely be unable to efficiently power the rest of your systems all the way. Higher class reactors simply allow you to use stronger weapons, stronger shields, and slower but stronger overall engines at the cost of increased mass. Class A fighters and destroyers might want to allocate more points into weapons as they can equip more weapons effectively due to not needing as many engines to power and not having access to strong shields that don't make much of a difference if you allocate 6 versus 12 power. Whereas Class C ships might want to maximize their shields to compensate for the reduced mobility. As you already know, you can see how much power your reactors provide and how much power your equipment takes. The system, however, does not include the grab drive into the calculations. Ideally, you want to fully power all your systems, so carefully choose which and how many weapons, shields, and engines you use. For example, two engines with full power allocation are more effective than four engines at half power allocation. The same goes for weapons. I'll explain further in depth later, but if you know that you only have or want to put 6 points into your shields, it doesn't make sense to use a shield module with a max power allocation of 12. So take the time to consider which systems you want to power and which parts you'll use. Putting that into practice, if you don't have a lot of power to allocate, maybe consider using automatic weapons. Automatic weapons are more forgiving than non-automatic variants because they build a charge. The gauge might take longer to fill up at lower power allocations, but the weapon will fire at full rate as long as the gauge isn't empty. Now let's reduce the power allocation to 1, and the rate of fire will remain the same. Compared to the semi-automatic variant, whose rate of fire depends on the power allocated. Some 
every module has mass. Mass is very important because it determines the overall maneuverability of your ship. As your ship packs on mass, it will become less maneuverable and reduce the inter-system jump range. Mass, to some degree, can be countered by using better engines. For my testing, it seems that every point of one mass requires about 12.35 maneuvering thrust to maintain maximum performance. So four Supernova 2000 Class C engines have a combined maneuvering thrust of 25,800 and can therefore support 2,089 mass at 100 mobility. Let's test it out. Currently sitting at 2,089 mass, by adding one more mass, we pass the threshold. Just to show you another example, let's use four Anum 7 engines with a product of 8,800 maneuvering thrust. Using 12.35 as our linear equation again, the engines should be able to support 712 mass. Our math checks out again. It is very important to carefully select the modules and parts you want to use to ensure that you can achieve the results you want with as little mass as possible. Mass plays into so many different systems that managing it is probably the most difficult part of shipbuilding. Engines provide engine thrust, which determines the acceleration of your ship, maneuvering thrust, which determines mobility, as mentioned before, and the class of the engine determines the top speed. You can stack on as many engines on your ship as you want, as long as the maximum power that can be allocated to the system remains under 12. This is where bigger doesn't always mean better. Take the SA-4110 engines versus the White Dwarf 3030 engines as an example. The White Dwarf has a clearly better engine and maneuvering thrust and requires a higher ship design perk level, but has more mass and requires 3 power per engine as opposed to the 2 power required for the SA-4110 engines. If we look at it this way, the SA actually provides more maneuvering thrust, but less engine thrust per power point. So a ship that has 6 SA engines would be able to haul more mass efficiently than 4 white dwarfs, so plan your engines accordingly. You may find that your ship is light enough that by using more efficient engines or more engines in general, doesn't actually impact the overall performance of your ship, and would just take up power and credits. This is because regardless of your mass or engine, your ship cannot exceed a mobility of 100. You may think that the quantity or the quality of engines you have determines the top speed, however that is incorrect. The top speed of your ship is determined by the lowest top speed of the engines you have equipped. SA engines have higher top speeds but usually less maneuvering thrust, and also have much less mass compared to higher class engines. Class C engines will have a much higher maneuvering thrust insinuating it is for larger, heavier ships. Class A engines typically have a top speed of 150. Class B at 140. And Class C at 130. However, if you have an engine with a top speed at 150 and an engine with a top speed of 130, the lower top speed will determine the overall top speed. It does not average. There are some experimental engines with a higher than typical top speed for the class of the engine, but these are perk, level, and possibly location locked. More testing is required. For example, the White Dwarf 3015 is a class A engine with a top speed of 180. So in conclusion, use no more than what you need and use the right tools for the job. If only two engines can achieve the result you want, there's no need to unnecessarily add more engines taking up more power. If gone unpowered, it will reduce the overall effectiveness of your ship, as mentioned before. No matter the class of grav drive or the grav jump thrust, the max jump range you can achieve in a single jump is 30 light years. Longer distances require more jumps and should use more fuel, but more on that later. I haven't been able to figure out the equation used for grav jump thrust per mass, but 
and it may seem obvious, the more grab jump thrust, the more mass you can jump at maximum efficiency. However, it isn't a big difference. It seems that Bethesda purposely designed the system so that jump distance could not be at the maximum 30 for most functional ships. Even a mid-game grab drive with 30 jump thrust seems to reach the limit of jump thrust to mass ratio at around 600 mass. And the jump range drops pretty rapidly the more mass you pack on after the 600 mark, almost parabolically so. The equation is not linear. Grab drives do have a max mass limit unassociated with the jump range value. Again, however, I am not sure what the equation is. It seems highly unlikely you will reach the limit if you build a ship that by all means is normal. When trying to figure out the intricacies of this system, I ran into very strange behavior. However, this system might just be bugged. You'd think that by putting stuff into your cargo hold and increasing the mass of the ship, more fuel would be consumed when jumping, but my findings baffled me. I won't get into the details of my testing because the results were weird and wild and have no explanation for it other than it's bugged. Here are my six key findings. Cargo and inventory mass does not affect fuel costs. By loading stuff into your cargo hold or on your personal inventory, fuel costs does not change. Ship mass does not affect fuel costs. No matter how heavy your ship is, the fuel cost will not change. Only grab jump thrust affects fuel cost. Grab jumping from outside your ship takes more fuel in some cases than inside your ship due to weird behavior with how load screens and fast traveling affect the calculations. Having higher grab jump thrust actually increases fuel cost and having lower grab jump thrust decreases fuel cost. At first, I thought this was bugged, but I guess you could argue that stronger engines require more fuel, similar to cars. Much like every other system, use the right tools for the job. If you don't want to use as much fuel, use a less powerful grab drive. Having to jump multiple times to reach the same destination does increase fuel costs, though I'm not sure by how much. My conclusion here is that to maximize fuel efficiency and minimize fuel cost, use the weakest grab drive your mass can allow, but strive for around 20 jump range. Aside from that, this is what you should generally keep in mind when building your ships when it comes to fuel. Even if you don't have any refueling stations, I have yet to come across a situation where I'll ever need more than 400 fuel. If you do have refueling stations, you probably won't need more than 200 fuel. But even these are very generous numbers. Fuel is heavy, so keep that in mind when building. Shields are pretty straightforward, however I'll include it in the guide because the same rules apply. Bigger doesn't always mean better. If I understand this system correctly, then max shield refers to the max health your shield will be at when fully powered, not per power point. Using that as the assumption, take for example these class B shields. The Tower 410's max shield health far exceeds the Warden SG200, but if you calculate the shield health per power point allocation, the Warden beats it by 11 more max shield health per power allocation. This means that if you only have 5 power points allocation into shields, be it from damage to your ship, or it's simply all the power you can allocate due to powering other systems, it is more efficient and more effective to use the Warden SG200s rather than the Tower 410s in that situation. On the other hand, if you look at the Vanguard Bulwark shields, you actually generate 121 shields per power point. So even if you couldn't power it all the way, unlike engines, it would be more effective and provide more overall shields. It may seem annoying to calculate the shield to power ratio, but sometimes it's worth it. This might be obvious, but I'll include it anyway for redundancy. The quality and quantity of landing gears you use is determined by the mass of your ship. The math here is pretty simple. Every point of lander thrust can support 200 mass. So if your ship weighs at 801 to 1000 mass, you need a sum of 5 landing thrust. If your ship weighs at 800 mass, your ship only needs 4 landing thrust. Every cargo hold has about 4.7 to 4.8 cargo capacity per every mass. 
This has a lot of implications, but mainly just that bigger isn't always better, as the ratios are always the same. The last topic we'll cover will be crew. This one can be pretty confusing just because of how things are named. There are three stats when it comes to filling your ship with crew members. Crew stations, crew capacity, and passenger slots. Passenger slots are simply the total number of passengers you can ferry in your ship at any time. These are for ferry quests and even some main quests that will require you to have one or two passengers. Crew members do not take up passenger slots and vice versa. Crew stations is the max number of crew you can have manning your ship, not including your current companion follower. This is limited also by your rank in the ship command skill under your social skill tree. This value is affected by your cockpit, control room habs, and battle station habs. However, note that while your ship may have 7 crew stations, the number displayed under the crew label on the info panel reflects the number of crew your ship can support. Meaning. If the crew capacity value is greater than crew stations, then the crew rating is equal to the crew station value. And if the crew capacity value is less than crew stations, the crew rating is equal to crew capacity rounded down. However, just because crew capacity is less than crew rating, or vice versa, doesn't mean the ship's modules won't operate at maximum efficiency. The only downside is that you won't be able to have crew members on board to increase their stats. They don't affect the ship's performance beyond their perks as far as I can tell. Your ship's reactor, engine, weapon, and shield modules all have crew capacity rating. This number is the number of crew members that can man that system. Engines have a rating of 0.25, weapons and shields have a rating of 0.5, and reactors have a rating of 1, 2, or 3 depending on the class of the reactor. Let's use some examples. Let's take the Frontier. The Frontier has two crew stations from the cockpit and nothing else. However, it has a total rating of 4 crew capacity. 4 weapons, each providing 0.5, 2 engines, each providing 0.25, shields, providing 0.5, and a class A reactor, providing 1. This means that the crew rating of the ship is a total of 2, and therefore can only support 2 crew members. Now let's use my Normandy build as the next example. The Normandy has 2 crew stations from the cockpit, and 4 from crew stations from the control room hab, totaling 6. It has 4 weapons, providing 2. 4 engines, providing 1, shields, providing 0.5, and a class A reactor, providing 1. The ship can support up to 6 crew members, but can only make use of 4.5, so this Normandy build would have a crew rating of 4, and therefore can only support 4 crew members. With all that said, I hope that this helps anyone who wants to go a bit deeper into ship building beyond just the basics. I'm continually impressed with the depth of some of the systems in the game and how deeply the design goes, with the exception of fuel and fuel consumption in its current bugged state. With shipbuilding alone, it's crazy how all the systems interact and bounce off one another. I have yet to delve too deeply into outposts, but I can't wait. If you guys enjoyed the content, please go ahead and leave a like, it would really help me break through the algorithm. And if you have any questions or comments, go ahead and leave them below and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Thank you guys all for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.